this is going to be a talk about um, kind of a book project that I'm working on. And there's a very specific topic within that book project. Unlike traditional talks that I give, it's not going to have a very clear cut conclusion. Uh, but, well, well, we'll get to that. Okay, so I like to waste my time watching videos like this. Uh, you quickly see what's wrong with this. Beautiful. But, you know, one, one thing you can think when you're viewing this sort of thing is this would be a very useful skill to have. And that's interesting because you're initially then representing this as some sort of theoretically possible course of action that you could take which doesn't really correspond to the way the world actually works. Now that's very interesting because that intuition pulls against the theory that I'm going to be defending in this talk, which I call the C theory of time. The C theory of time in very kind of short terms holds that there's when we represent the world you know, as going forwards in time or going backwards in time, we're not representing different ways the world could be. We're giving the equivalent of representations of one possibility. So the idea is that here, we've just shown a process against its natural kind of causal direction. When we're, represent when we're viewing this backwards, we don't think this is really representing a different possible world. We think it's representing uh, the world in which we actually live, but sort of in an unfamiliar perspective. Now this will become a bit more clear as I kind of flesh out the theory that I defend. But in more simple terms, one you know, basic philosophical problem that people have been trying to resolve from many different perspectives throughout you know, recent centuries in physics and philosophy is the fact that when we see uh, processes like this, we think, well, with the arrow of time pointing from left to right here, this looks like a familiar process, hopefully not overly familiar. And you'll see that it's a pretty odd way for the glass to break, as though there's some kind of, I don't know, opera singer or uh, surrogate sort of electronic opera singer in the room, shattering the glass in the right way. But when we flip this like that, we have the arrow of time pointing in the other direction, suddenly this looks like an unfamiliar process, right? This is a really simple intuition to kind of get to grips with the kind of issue that I'm interested in and I'm trying to get over to you today. We've not changed anything in the particle makeup of the glasses or anything like that. All I've done is kind of flipped the way in which the arrow of time points here, and yet it seems suddenly we're faced with a process that, that is fundamentally different. That's a kind of a little bit paradoxical. So, in short, to kind of set this up, in this book that I'm writing at the moment, I'm defending a position I call the C theory of time. I will give a, you know, an elaborate account of why I use such exotic terminology there uh, a li little later in the talk. But in brief, the C theory holds that there's no kind of intrinsic or fundamental directionality of time. Catching that out in itself is, is part of the project. Uh, and more simply, we can think that the two directions of time, so the two possible ways in which we can describe the world as going from one time to another, such as from our past to our future, or from our future towards our past, are ontologically on a par. There's nothing kind of better about describing the world from the past to the future. And the main thesis of this is that if this is like a, you know, this is a metaphysical theory, this is a fundamental ontology or something like that, it should not be losing out on any important explanations we have within physics, within the sciences. All good explanations of things should depend solely on, uh, no good explanations of, of things should depend solely on uh, the idea, in, in least in part, of time being intrinsically directed. Now, the main problem for this kind of account is that it flies against our intuitions. We think that the world, the universe, looks very different in the, the opposite directions of time. Uh, a world run backwards, we ordinarily think is a world which is replete with all sorts of vastly improbable processes. Importantly, we think there is such a thing as this world run backwards. And we straightforwardly, ordinarily take our world to really run from past to future, and not from future to past. So the main focus today is firstly to kind of spell out a lot of the ideology and polemics in the position that I defend, and the kind of common pitfalls and things like that. 
But to gear it into uh, seeing how thinking about time in terms of the C theory affects our judgments as to uh, whether or not the uh, low entropy early universe, which we're talking about in the reading group, uh, it stands in any spe you know, special sort of explanatory need, whether this theory has anything to say for that. <coughs> Right, so a very simple plan. Firstly, I'm going to discover some you know, very simplistic account of what the problem of the arrow of time is. It'll probably be quite familiar to, to some of you. Uh, then I'll give an account of the position I call the C theory of time, why it has that terminology, what its aims are, and how to understand it. And then I'm going to look at how exactly the problem of initial conditions and special initial conditions can be understood within the context of the C theory. So that's where kind of the useful content is. Okay, so here's a you know, traditional cliche picture of a bunch of uh, dead white guys uh, who play a very important role in the development of the second order thermodynamics and our understanding of the second order thermodynamics. Now, in very simple terms, the, the law holds that the entropy of isolated systems does not decrease over time. Uh, we can think of entropy as roughly some sort of measure of the mechanically unusable energy of a system, a measure of useless heat in the system, although there's so many different amounts of you know, definitions of entropy that I could give a very long talk about that in theory. Uh, and given contemporary understanding of, of, of Boltzmannian statistical mechanics, we can think of the, the second law of thermodynamics as something like a statistical generalization, not an exceptionless and fundamental law, but it's still a very empirically accurate law nonetheless. Now, importantly, it's time asymmetric. It says something about the property of systems that only increases over time and does not decrease over time. So it says different things about what can happen towards the future, uh, than what can happen towards the past. <coughs> now, as you presumably all know, thermodynamics is a macro science. It's concerned with macroscopic condition, things that we can, uh, we can describe the properties of a thermal system in thermodynamic <coughs> terms, in terms of things like you know, pressure and volume types of things we can actually measure. Uh, and from the mid 19th century, physicists have attempted to give a kind of a microscopic or mechanical theory of thermodynamics, in particular, how to understand the second law of thermodynamics purely in uh, something like mechanical terms. So, in terms of the variables of positions and momenta of pastel particles and things like that. And the classic problem here is that, well, in the classical understanding of things, microscopic processes are not in any sense importantly directed in time. I mean, you can think, you can plug some metaphysics of time direction into this and think that really all the little billy balls here are going in some direction, they're really all going towards the future in some particular direction. But the important thing is that no matter how they evolve, if you were to hypothetically invert all of the, the momenta, then they would retrace their steps to the earlier state. So this is, in very rough terms, known as a time reversal invariance of, of mechanics. That for any process allowed by the fundamental laws of physics, the time reversed process is also allowed by the fundamental laws of physics. So if this is an allowable evolution, then this is also an allowable evolution. This is obviously depicting uh, the same three particles at two different times. And so extrapolating from that, if we're to think of things like wine glasses as being you know, made up of uh, microscopic particles, and the, the laws governing these wine glasses as being fully recoverable from the laws governing the microscopic particles, then if this process is possible, I'm always going to this side and there's just at least one of the people in the room is there. <laughs> also, this doesn't seem to, it's like magic, it doesn't, lasers 
Um, at this point. Uh, once I actually lent this to someone giving a talk after he was only quite a bit older than me and hadn't used one before and they kept finding the audience so <laughs> now I feel like I should be very careful of these things. Um, yeah, so yeah, the idea is that obviously given that we should think that really uh, contrary to our standard intuitions uh, there's in a sense, you know, it, it's equally possible in a sense for for this to happen as for this to happen. And for all we know, we can really be in a world where all our beliefs about direction of causation are, are, are wrong and things like that. So this is kind of the problem of the micro micro reversibility. So Ludwig Boltzmann has played a really prominent role in giving an account of how we can match the time asymmetry of the macroscopic world with the time asymmetry of the microscopic world. His view, and he had a kind of a very kind of well thought about philosophical view about, about the error of time. He thought the error of time is a matter of statistics. He thought that it's sort of an emergent property of the world, it's not some underlying property of the world. Really, if we don't have enough particles in the world to form Kind of thermal systems or you know sufficiently large uh, number of particles to have all the gases and so on, then there will be no sense in which the universe has a direction of time. So he has a statistical account, a statistical mechanical account of thermodynamical entropy, and in very simple terms, high entropy states can be thought of just as numerically com combinatorially far more likely than low entropy states. Uh, and because of this, we should expect for any system that's not in maximal entropy for its entropy to increase. Just because it's far more probable than for it to decrease. Now I feel I'm maybe pitching this bit of the talk a bit low, but I will go through it in any case. Uh, so a really simple way to see what Boltzmann did, how he kind of understood entropy is to kind of give this really toy example. Imagine that we have uh, a setup where we have all these numbered balls, like they're all billiard balls, and we have two boxes, and we the, so we're going to have two dif different things here. A macro state is going to be a statement of the macroscopic state of the system. So in, in this sense, a macro state is going to tell you how many balls are in each box, something that you can do by kind of measuring in weighing the box or something like that. And the micro state is going to give the fine grained details of which balls are in which box, which you know, if the box is closed, that's something we don't have access to. And the entropy, the statistical mechanical entropy, is something like a measure of how many micro states will correspond to any given macro state. And so the macro state has a high entropy if a very large set of microstates give rise to that microstate, and a very low entropy if only you know, a relatively small number of microstates give rise to that. So for example, the microstate where all the balls are in the blue box is going to correspond only to one microstate, there's only one way for that to be. So that's going to be very, very low entropy, it's going to be very improbable for that just to kind of come about through some sort of you know, random shuffling mechanism or something like that. Likewise, all the balls in the yellow box is going to be exactly the same. But you can see, as soon as you start to mix things up, you're going to increase the entropy quite dramatically. So one ball in the blue box and 19 balls in the yellow box is going to correspond to 20 uh, microstates. So that one little shift, suddenly we have you know, all these possible ways for that to come about. And then very quickly, it becomes impossible to visually depict what's going on. So five balls in the blue and 15 in the yellow is going to correspond to like more than 15,000 microstates. And an even spread of 10 in each is going to correspond to over 180,000 possible microstates. So you can kind of very simply see that, well, if we see absolutely nothing about the individual likelihood of any particular microstate, if you're going to guess what macrostate the system is in, this is the one that's going to be far more probable than any other. Kind of dominates the, the, the phase space, so to speak. 
so this is how Boltzmann understood entropy. I mean, so he has his famous uh, equation sketched onto his, uh, onto his gravestone there. S equals k log w, where you can think of w as the number of kind of number in inverted commas, because I'm not going to get into technical details here, that's like a torn apart by someone who's far more about than I do, so it's Katie. Uh, so w you can think of as like the number of microstates that correspond to the system's macrostate. S is just the Boltzmann entropy, and uh, k is, is its constant. Which we don't have to care too much about what that is exactly, but it does its job very nicely. So, what do we get from this? Well, we can see that if we understand entropy in this particular way, then there should be no surprise that for any system which is not already in maximal entropy, that it will tend towards high entropy because there's many more ways for that to happen. The big problem is that this kind of reasoning, in a sense, works too well. Because if we try to apply this reasoning towards the past, we try to think about you know, why was the, the, the past of the universe in the way it was, or what was the state of the past, or something like that, and we use just this sort of combinatorial kind of uh, lines of reasoning, then we'll see that it's far more likely for the past to actually be higher entropy rather than lower entropy just because there's many more ways for the past to be higher entropy than lower entropy. Now we don't think that processes like this are very common, so this is where sort of the general problem of uh, the so-called past hypothesis of the lower entropy the universe really comes from. It's just from trying to generalize this line of reasoning which is very useful in understanding why entropy increases towards the future when uh, it's, it's an attempt to generalize it towards the past where it clearly does not have the same sort of empirical success. Yeah. So jumping forward to the, well, actually the 20th century, but continuing to the 21st century, uh, so Hugh Price, philosopher in Cambridge, says, well, what we should learn from this, as philosophers interested in the era of time, is that the real problem never actually was why entropy increases, which is what people were trying to resolve initially by producing an, a mechanical account of the second law of thermodynamics. We shouldn't have to uh, give an account of why shattered glasses never reform and sugar cubes don't and so on, because we know it's just very unlikely for that to occur. So the real problem was actually why entropy could ever, you know, ever was so low in the first place. So on a standard view, in order to account, in order to make, effectively, you know, to ground our beliefs that the universe has evolved from low entropy states, then we have to kind of put this in by hand. And you know, the further we go into the past, the more unlikely the state of the universe seems to be on this account. So, you know, in the Emperor's New Mind, Roger Penrose pulls out this calculation that the, the kind of low entropy universe he wants in his cosmology has, you know, on I don't think it's actually on the Boltzmannian account. Uh, I think, in fact, Craig Hunter talks a little bit about this in the paper, about why this isn't a very well-grounded uh, probability. But he, he comes up with this number, the, the early universe being that particular state. The chance of that, apropos of everything, yeah, absolutely nothing else, is 1 in 10 to the 10 to the 123. So we vanishingly small probability. And this has raised all sorts of kind of radical sceptical problems which philosophers kind of love and hate at the same time. Uh, the so-called Boltzmann brain paradox, which has kind of got a lot of mileage in places like New Scientist over the last decade or so. So given this sort of Boltzmannian statistical reasoning, we should actually expect the min minimal possible deviation from maximum entropy for the universe that is required to support our observations, experiences, beliefs, memories, and so on. So we want to explain why it is the world appears the way it does from our perspective. Well, we should not commit to uh, you know, an unnecessarily improbable state. So the best way to do this is to suppose that really you're just a little you know, brief fluctuation from you know, the void of this super of high entropy into cell this little brain that comes replete with all these you know, uh, beliefs about the world. 
So this is kind of like an extreme skeptical position. Clearly it's not a good way to go. Is it a big problem for the Boltzmannian account? Or some people think it's a devastating problem. Other people think, no, it's a sort of problem that philosophers learn, you know, not to really try to resolve, but to kind of more live with. And there are better ways to deal with the philosophical treatment of such theories. Uh, Uh, but, you know, in simple terms, how this, how this paradox is meant to go is that the Boltzmannian picture leaves very you know, completely unexplained how it is that we actually find ourselves in a large region, or at least we believe we find ourselves in a very large region of low entropy. We think that the, the observable universe, as far as we can see, is very low entropy levels. You know, and holes, whatever. And we believe that entropy was far lower in the past than it is presently. We don't think it was higher in the past. We don't think that we're in fluctuation. So if we're to hold these fixed, then it seems that there's something that isn't coming out of the box money picture that we want. I always get stuck on this paradox. Um, but I don't think that it's any more dramatic than any of the traditional philosophical skeptical problems. It's not even clear to me it's that much more problematic than like Bertrand Russell's you know, case where you know, if the world would appear exactly the same and it's popped into existence five minutes ago. He's not appealing to any thermodynamic uh, or statistical mechanical reasoning there, but it's the same sort of thing. We, you know, we make certain assumptions about the past that mix up, you know, that, that seems to make true the sorts of things we want to believe about the history of the world and so on. So this is a problem which is addressed quite some length by David Albert in his very uh, impactful book, Time and Chance. He says that, well, we should see that this really is a big problem. He thinks a full-blown skeptical catastrophe is around the corner because retrodiction, so you know, prediction but towards the past, afterwards going to count it as extraordinarily unlikely that the very experiments which we took uh, to have confirmed classical mechanics in the first place, which go in <coughs> to this line of reasoning, uh, ever actually occurred. So, you know, what we're trying to do is give a mechanical account of thermodynamics, but why, why should we believe that the laws of mechanics are actually you know, true of the world? Well, we have to make certain assumptions about the past, so it seems that there, there's a sense in which this kind of argument is a little bit self-defeating. So he thinks that the reliability of prediction and retrodiction themselves are patently going to have to require that there be some reliable technique of inference other than just prediction and retrodiction, which is pointing to you know, a, a different kind of attitude to how we should think about things like initial conditions. So, I mean, Albert holds that, well, we should believe in this thing, we call it the past hypothesis, it's the, the hypothesis that the early universe just was in some particular low entry state, whatever is required to ground our otherwise seemingly well grounded beliefs about the past and so on. And he derives this terminology from, from Feynman, who's talking about this in the lectures on gravitation. He says that the success of scientific inferences indicate that the world did not come from a fluctuation, therefore I think it's necessary to add to the physical laws the hypothesis that the past uh, was more ordered than it is today and he thinks that this additional statement is needed to make sense uh, and to make an understanding of uh, irreversibility. So we don't just think that this is very much on the lines of what we're talking about with, with calendar that we should think that the past hypothesis is some sort of some part of the package that just goes into making sense of the past rather than something itself which we should seek to explain using traditional retrodictive practices. Yeah. Can, can I ask what you think you mean by these uh, phrases to make sense and to make an understanding? In the, like, two things you might think is like whether you kind of think there's like some actual kind of incoherence you're avoiding. So like mm. by making sense you're avoiding nonsense. Or is it just that like you want some positive explanation and we just want to avoid a situation where we we haven't got nonsense, we haven't got an explanation either. Yeah, I take it that it's an attempt to avoid just like full blind scepticism about about the past. That you know, we, we take it for being 
So this is lectures on gravitation, but here he's giving all these lectures on the laws of physics, and his background view is that there are laws of physics, reliable laws of physics, and so on. And in order to really hold that, then you do have to take some attitude towards the past hypothesis that it's part of the laws of physics. I, I think we take it. Otherwise, we're, we're, we do just wander into these kind of sceptical paradoxes. OK, but do you think there's like two things, like one thing is making sense, and then the other mm -hmm. thing is providing positive understanding? So it's like, first yeah. we avoid disaster, and then we try to understand it yeah, as far yeah. as we can go. Yeah, I mean, he uses he uses the term understanding quite loosely across his writing. So I, I don't I wouldn't want to put too strong a view of what he means by understanding. But he has a few that no one understands what he means. Provides method of explanations. Uh, yeah. yeah, he thinks that he, he understands something when yeah, he can give, give the explanations of them to other people and okay. provide the illusion of understanding in them. I think. Okay, thanks. No, that's but I'm not. Yeah, he's written a lot about this. And I mean, so he says, you know, he gets this view from, from Feynman and Albert says this. But Boltzmann makes a very similar claim on these lines that the second law of thermodynamics can be proved from the mechanical theory if one assumes that the present state of the universe started to evolve from an improbable state uh, and is still in a relatively improbable state. He says this is a reasonable assumption to make since it enables us to explain the facts of experience. And one should not expect to be able to deduce it right, from anything more fundamental. So again, this is really that we sort of we have to live with this idea that we, we just stipulate that there is this kind of low entropy in the universe that coupled with our you know, classical statistical mechanics will give us a good account of why this entropy increases and gives a good account of how thermal phenomena behaves. And I think that sort of pragmatic treatment of the status of the past hypothesis is very much in line with the position that Canada holds. He says that the past hypothesis is in the past, or well, the past state, so the state which is hypothesized by the past hypothesis. Uh, he says it's simple, it's potentially unifying with cosmology, it has mountains of indirect evidence, via our evidence for thermodynamics, etc. Uh, yes, it's still highly improbable. It's far from automatic, though, that a low probability events all deserve an explanation. If they did, it seems here that many other theoretical and empirical virtues of the past state uh, should trump any vice due to its improbability. So he's suggesting that we shouldn't think of the, the statistical probability of the past state to be some reason why we shouldn't appeal to it in our explanations of uh, thermal phenomena, things like that. Okay, so now my aim is to have a look at this issue of whether or not the, the, the past state, the state positive by the past hypothesis, is re in, you know, requires kind of best explanation. I'll do this in terms of what I call the C theory of time. So now we'll do a bit of metaphysics of time. So when people talk about time having a direction, they ordinarily uh, kind of have a cluster of different views, and some of them I think we need to extract from the conversation so we can get clear what's actually an issue. So one view that has received more attention by philosophers than the thing I'm interested in is the so-called passage or flow of time. So there's this traditional picture of this kind of tripartite structure of the universe, so it's divided into past, the present, and the future, we are all located in the present, and the present has a special property that it kind of it flows towards the future, like that. So we can think of this question that lots of philosophers ask as time pass. Now, the two uh, kind of canonical theories in the philosophy of time are the A theory and the B theory, also known as the tensed and the tenseless theories of time. And in very short terms, the A theory of time holds that the passage of time is some sort of objective feature of the universe. It's something which is independent of our perceptions and things like that. There is some basic property of the universe whereby time passes. Whereas the B theory of time holds that the passage of time uh, 
is something less than objective. It's, some, it's a way in which we represent the world very reliably, but it doesn't correlate to some actual property of the universe independently of us. Now, this problem, and one of, the, one of the reasons why I'm not so interested in this question, is that it doesn't seem to have any important uh, explanatory bearing with respect to science. There's a sort of psychological aspect of this dispute. Right? The interesting thing about this model is it, it seems to correlate exactly, or very roughly at least, to uh, how adult human beings conceptualise and represent time. We, we naturally think about certain things being fixed in the past, there are certain unknown things in the future, we act in the present, and so on. It's a very useful way of modelling time. But it's not obviously explanatory of anything in a kind of a third personal sense. We never appeal to the passing of time to explain why the electron behaved in the way it did or something like that. That seems to be a kind of a, a conceptual mistake. But if we're to think of a kind of a more minimal sense of directionality, we can ask the question, is time intrinsically directed? Is the universe such that the past to future direction is kind of structurally different from the future to past direction or something? That the universe really goes from past to future and not future to past. That's something that does seem to be appealed to in explanations of like, physical phenomena, much more generally. Now, the question of whether time has a direction is what separates what I will call the B theory. So, the, the B theory of time is always presented in these terms, but if you go back to the origin of the terminology, it's a the best way to understand the B theory is that it does hold that time is structured as having a direction. And what I call the C theory holds that time kind of is, is not intrinsically directed. Now, I think this is the yeah, by far the more interesting question. Partly, at least prim maybe primarily, that it's independent of the psychology of time, insofar as we think that very often directionality is taken to play some important role in scientific explanations. It's kind of very central to when we give causal explanations, right? We think causal explanations are from past to future, not future to past. And as we saw at the very beginning, the two temporal directions seem to give very different explanatory stories. We try to explain the past in terms of the future, it requires a very different uh, mode of explanation than when we try to explain the future in terms of the past. And it's just standard for us to represent processes, not just visually, but when we you know, produce like, scientific models of things, we represent things as going from past to future. We think that some particle has a particular velocity which dictates how it moves towards the future. So all this terminology of uh, A and B and C goes back to this guy who was a uh, Cambridge philosopher who grew up in Bristol called John McTaggart, Ellis McTaggart, one of the few people who's got the name McTaggart twice in their name. So the A theory derives from his A series, which he holds as a series of positions which runs from the past to the present to the future. And the B theory of time derives from his B series, which is what he calls a series of positions which run from earlier to later. The thing that he was interested in is he thought that real time required this sense of genuine change or genuine flow. If we think about the two world wars, there was a time when World War I was present, and then there was, you know, time passed, and then World War II became present, and World War I became past, and then we get to where we are now, where they're both in the past. He thought that time requires there to be events that change these temporal properties over time. On the B series, all we see at any particular time is that World War I is earlier than World War II. That's not something that changes as time passes. So it doesn't seem to be giving you enough to give an account of real time for the tagger. That doesn't interest me so much, although this does seem to have been the, the main dispute which has received more interest in like, the philosophy of physics when people will think about the so-called uh, you know, block universe view. So this is a classic you know, quote from Einstein. He says that, well, we physicists know that the distinction between past, present, and future 
is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. One thing he's saying from that is that we seem to learn from relativity theory that time is moving past, that time is some, with the world is some four dimensional thing, although we don't know things about the future, they are really out there, our younger selves are really out there as well, and so on. And there's been loads written about this, but there's been less written about whether or not this block has some arrow on it. There could be an arrow on this block, it doesn't change the fact of whether or not the future is kind of, in a sense, really out there, the past is still out there. But it plays an important role in how we explain processes that seem to go from here to here, and not from here to here. This, incidentally, is a four-dimensional representation of the moon uh, orbiting the Earth. So this is uh, Arthur Eddington. In The Nature of the Physical World, he talks a little bit about this, where he, he coined the term the arrow of time, or time's arrow. He says that the great thing about time is that it goes on. This is an aspect of time that the physicist seems inclined to neglect. He says, in the four-dimensional world, events lie spread out before us in a map. And we see in this map the path from past to future, or from future to past. But there's no signboard to indicate that it's a one-way street. So he thinks that the fundamental physical description of the world doesn't really tell us that things are going from past to future as opposed to future to past. I don't know how much Eddington would have liked uh, Physics Road at the University of Sydney, which actually is a one-way street, which surprised me when I was there. And this idea of whether or not the universe and the pop universe is really directed or not, I think is, I don't know, I, I see there being pros and cons in this. I, I, def I defend the view that holds that the, the block universe is not directed, but I can see why people would reject that view. I think there's an interesting issue in it, and it kind of gives two different sort of paradigm ways of thinking about things like climate evolution and explanation and so on. So we can think that, you know, ordinarily, we tend to explain uh, uh, like final conditions or the statism system in terms of its initial conditions plus the laws rather than in terms of the final conditions plus the laws. That seems to be a fact about the way we describe and explain the world. The notion of cause and effect are very useful in the world. Causes invariably perceive their effects in time. There's a couple of senses here then in which uh, the time of the universe kind of hypothesis is very, very useful. Likewise, we think about this more generally uh, as holding that you know things. We tend to hold that things depend upon things in the past and not on things in the future. When we talk about particles having dispositions, dispositions are usually described as determining how something evolves towards the future and not how it evolves towards the past. Likewise, when we think about chances, they tend to be you know, future directed, not past directed, we don't tend to think of the past as inherently chancy, we think it's kind of effectively fixed. Now, the position that I defend uh, kind of rejects this so-called time directed universe hypothesis, I call it the temporary a-directional universe, which is the acronym of tau, which uh, is the symbol for proper time. And this holds that time is not directed, and a big task here is just to work out what it means for time not to be directed and what, it, what we have to reject when we hold that time is not directed. So I think it's useful to kind of give an account of where this terminology comes from and how, how we should think about the idea of time not having a direction. So something that's not very often talked about in the philosophy of McTaggart, I mean, no one also talks about these necessary and sufficient conditions for love either, but so be it. They're really out there. Uh, he talks about this third time series. He talked about it in his, initially, in his initial 1908 paper, The Unreality of Time, which is his famous paper where he argues that time isn't real. And then there's a huge amount written about this C series in his uh, 1927 book. Uh, which he, he died before he ever actually completed. It was kind of published on his behalf by 
another philosopher abroad. He held in his original paper that the C series, while it determines the order of events in time, so it determines what, which events are kind of between which other two events in, in time, it doesn't determine direction. So he kind of gives this idea of the C series as being something ordered by temporal betweenness, whereas the B series, which is a bit more familiar to us, is, is ordered in terms of earlier and later. It's, so we can have this image here, so we have you know, time not running from this side to this side, but time is giving us this kind of spread or events ordered by between us. We have these four events, M and O, P. He says that if the C series runs M, N, O, P, then we can impose upon this a B series from earlier to later, but it can run either from M to P, so that so M is earlier than P, or it can run from P to N. But he says there's nothing within the series, the C series, which determines this. So what he's trying to get at is you get this bare picture of time as some set of events which is ordered by some between this relation. But there's not sufficient structure to talk about an initial member of that series of events. No final member either. It's a much more kind of uh, basic picture of time. And in his account of uh, how we should understand time in light of classical physics and his really ridiculously dense and brilliant book, The Direction of Time, Hans Reichenbach said that when we're dealing with classical mechanics, because we have this feature of time reversibility in classical mechanics, we should say that it's always possible to construct uh, a converse description. So for any process of some vehicles moving around, if we give a description of them, then it's always possible to get a converse description, which is a description relative to negative time. He says, because of this, we should think of positive and negative time supplying equivalent descriptions. So they're really describing the same thing. They're different ways of saying the same thing. He says it would be meaningless to ask which of the two descriptions is true. So if I can think about two events in the C series, event M and event O, he says it would be meaningless uh, in, in the case of a you know, reversible system to ask whether M came before O or O came before M. There's just this sort of uh, undirected ordering of those things. Is there a thing that is claiming that independent of whatever the laws of physics may say? So well, this is a controversial issue. Because he, he does this within the context of classical mechanics. Classical mechanics has the property of time reversibility. But he uses this idea that forwards and backwards in time descriptions are equivalent to give an understanding of the asymmetry of thermodynamics also, where he holds that it's not really the case that entropy increases. Yeah, it's, it's as true in a sense to say that entropy really decreases. Those are two different equivalent ways of representing the same state of affairs. So what he says here does carry over to theories which are timely symmetric in their structure. And that, that's something which is quite important, I think. Someone else who was you know, thinking about slightly more exotic uh, cases than, than, than Reichenbach, but was a, was a contemporary of Reichenbach and was influenced by Reichenbach, was Thomas Gold, the cosmologist. Famously, he developed this, you know, his gold universe cosmology where we have a you know, big bang and a big crunch and as the universe is contracting towards a big crunch, the arrow of entropy kind of reverses and so on. It's kind of beautifully symmetrical universe. But he was influenced by, by a very similar kind of right back in style understanding of uh, time in classical physics. He says that the description of our universe in the opposite sense of time, so from future to past, Although it sounds very strange, so for it to sound very strange, you must be thinking here about higher level macroscopic things, so the like things like, like smashing glasses. Because if it's just billiard balls, then it doesn't sound strange to describe that piece of time. So he's thinking about macroscopic uh, things. So it sounds very strange to describe the universe backwards in time, but it's not in conflict with any laws of physics, where he obviously means you know, uh, classical laws of physics. 
Our strange description is not describing another universe or how this universe might be but isn't, but it's describing the very same thing. So it's really similar kind of point about the language here as it's writing back. When we're describing a universe forwards in time, backwards in time, we're just using two different ways of representing the same thing, describing the same thing. So this is completely in line with this idea of the ontology of time where events are kind of just ordered in this kind of their undirected ordering, as in the, the C series. And this is a position I take to be completely you know, giving an account of what I call the C theory. So we can think of positive and negative time as giving effectively two equivalent but kind of superficially different descriptions of one and the same world. So on this view, if we think about our world and think, well, could this world really happen backwards in time? Could it have run from future to the past? Well, on this view, no, it couldn't. Because when we describe it from future to the past, we're describing the same world. So any properties that seem to differ don't actually latch onto the real properties of the world. Right, so it's quite you know, significant. So later in his book, Reichenbach says it has no meaning, as I just said, uh, to say that entropy really goes up or that its time direction is really positive, in the sense these are conventions. But what he means by conventions is quite important. Okay, so now we'll get to the kind of the concluding section where I'm going to produce some interesting thought provoking content for uh, the post talk. Experience. So we have this picture here, you know, we want to say this is a familiar process, this is an unfamiliar process. We take that as a given, and any theory of time has to give an account of why it is that we have these different attitudes. Now, here's a philosopher who agrees with what I want to say almost exactly, but he holds almost exactly the opposite views as me, if that makes any sense. So in order to disagree with someone completely, they have to agree with a lot of the you know, way, basic ways of thinking about these things. My position makes sense, and surprise, it's kind of like a negation of what Tim Maudlin says. So this is, yeah, this is Tim, Tim Maudlin. Right, so, so Maudlin, in, in his book, uh, The Metaphysics Within Physics, gives he actually does the job of trying to give an account of why we think that time, it, why we ought to say time is intrinsically directed just from trying to give an explanation of uh, time asymmetric phenomena. Very often, this sort of thing is appealed to in like, oh, well, because things are different towards the future than towards the past, we just think that time is directed. But no one ever really gives a very obviously a clear argument for this. But Tim Morden does, and it's a really interesting uh, argument, and I think it's fundamentally mistaken for interesting reasons. But he, he talks about this kind of you know, general uh, stat-mech problem. So the initial states of en entropy increasing processes or entropy increasing systems, he says, are atypical in two distinct respects. So firstly, we can say that things like, like this, here with the wine glasses, that there's a macroscopic atypicality in the initial state because the initial state is low entropy. We've seen why low entropy is atypical, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very unlikely for something to just be low entropy. There's many more ways for it to be high entropy. So there's macroscopic atypicality, and that's going to be agreed on by all different attitudes towards the direction of time when trying to explain the past hypothesis, because we all agree that there's a past hypothesis, at least within this context. So the second thing he says is, what, I think he calls it microscopic atypicality. I prefer the, the word dynamical atypicality because it seems that the key thing here is it rests upon some sense of time evolution. So the microstates of any given system, which is increasing in entropy, are atypical insofar as if you, uh, if you try to evolve backwards in time from them, so you think of all the position, you know, positions and momenta of the particles in, in, in the wine glass, for example, here, and you flip the momenta, so you evolve them backwards. What's atypical about them is that you've evolved backwards, they tend away from higher entropy towards lower entropy. That in itself is, is very unlikely. 
so using his words, he says that this type of atypicality is uh, where a, a state or a system is atypical in a way that can only be characterized in terms of how the state will, in scare quotes, evolve through time. Uh, in that temporal evolution in one direction from it will lead over a very long period of time to monotonically lower entropy. And you can probably see where this argument is, is going. So the suggestion that Maudlin gives is that thinking of time in terms of the B theory, thinking that there really is a direction of time, that the universe really does go from past to future, gives, uh, kind of makes thermal processes more likely insofar as it kind of gets rid of the dynamical atypicality. He says it kind of it explains or explains them away the sense in which the microstate of the system at any given time in its entropy increasing you know, process uh, is dynamically atypical. He says that on the B theory, we simply understand systems as really evolving only towards the future and not towards the past. Towards the future, things are microscopically typical in that their microstate any at the time is of a quality such that if you were to evolve it towards the future, it goes towards a more probable state. We explain away the dynamical atypicality of states where we understand this as their sort of backwards pointing atypicality, the fact that they seem to evolve towards lower entropy towards the past. We explain that away by simply holding that, that that is just a product of the typical evolution towards higher entropy. That that doesn't correspond to a, a real direction of, of evolution. So he says that the dynamical atypicality of some, the particular given state is completely accounted for by how it was generated or produced. It is the product of an evolution from a generically characterized initial state. And this kind of explanation, which he thinks we can't do without, requires there be a fact about which states produce which, which is provided by a direction of time, where he defines the direction of time as some sort of basic, primitive, unanalyzable feature of the world. He thinks that there really is a fact of the matter as to what is the initial state of the universe that time really does go on from some initial state. Exactly the kind of thing that the sea theorist, like myself, and like Reichenbach and Gold and Price and other people, want to deny. Now, I agree with a lot of things that Hugh Price writes, but I disagree with something here, which is I think that part of his reason for, that he gives for why the low entropy initial state requires a special explanation is based on this heuristic which borrows from uh, this sort of maudlin style view theoretic way of thinking. He says that imagine in recent years physics has dis discovered that matter in the universe is collapsing towards a big crunch. And as it does so, something very peculiar is happening. The motions of the individual pieces of matter in the universe are somehow conspiring to defeat gravity's uh, tendency to pull things together. And somehow, by some extraordinary feat of cooperation, the various forces are bouncing out so that uh, by the time the big crunch matter would have spread out uh, with great uniformity. Now, we think that this would be extremely improbable that if something like this really were happening, if we discovered this was happening, then it would not be good physics practice to not seek to explain it, right? And crunch doesn't seem the right word, a big smear or something. Wrong. Yeah, so that's the, the term that they got. It's, so, it's, it's, it's smooth, right? That's what it is. Yeah. Very smooth crunch. But he says in his view, uh, however, and he thinks of his view as kind of following from the, 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 the position that we attributed to Reichen back earlier. This state of affairs is exactly what physics has discovered. He's merely taken advantage of the fact that there's no objective sense in which what we call the future is really the positive direction of time. 
Then, uh, given this, we can equally well describe the world by reversing the ordinary temporal labeling, relabeled this way, the familiar expansion of the universe from a smooth Big Bang uh, becomes a contraction to a smooth Big Crunch with the extraordinary characteristics just described. And surely, if it's a proper matter for explanation uh, described wrong, one way, it's a proper matter for explanation described the other. Now, this all sounds very appealing, right? He's, if the C theory is holding that there's, you know, that there is nothing objective about the sense of it's the world really goes towards the future as opposed to going towards the past, that describing things in terms of past and future are equivalent, then it seems fair game to say that, you know, a, a big crunch should be no more or no less likely or no less in the explanation than the big bang. So does this raise a problem for the C theory where it somehow offers less of an explanation for the initial universe than uh, the only universe than, than the B theory is, as, as, as Maudlin suggests? Well, Price is suggesting that by thinking of the lower B state in this kind of dynamical terms that we're meant to see that it requires a spectral explanation, otherwise kind of we have no grounds for expecting it to be to increase towards the future. But I think that there's a, a sense in which this way of presenting things really mischaracterizes uh, our understanding of the direction of time from the C theory. And it's something which, which Reichenbach does talk about and I think has not been properly appreciated. So I, I wrote a paper a little while back, kind of along these lines, which are pointing towards uh, or causation and time reversal, which holds that C theorists should hold that there is a preferred direction of causation in the universe. Just because there is this kind of basic symmetry with respect to how we describe, you know, regard past and future descriptions, the fact that they probably describe the same world, that doesn't require us to hold that there's no objective direction of causation. So forwards and backwards descriptions equivalently represent a single world. It doesn't follow that they are incapable of describing a world which has a preferred direction of causation, which grounds our use of causal terms. When we describe things backwards in time, we're not describing a different causal process, like Price seems to be suggesting. When we try to describe you know, a, a universe with a big bang and so on backwards in time, it seems wrong to talk about it as though it's referring to a different set of causal processes. Now that sounds counterintuitive, but it's something which it comes out of the conventional treatment of the direction of time within the C theory. So I'll give some kind of quotes from, from Reichenberg where he talks about this quite a subtle issue that I'm still kind of grappling with a bit. So Reichenberg says, if someone is arg arguing that it's a matter of convention to select the direction of growing entropy as a direction of time. Their conception cannot be called, called false. But they must not commit the error often connected with other forms of conventionalism, which is the error of overlooking the empirical content associated with the use of this convention. Right, so this is suggesting that, well, it is a convention to talk about entropy as increasing the universe is going from past to future. But there are there is empirical grounds for <coughs> this convention to the alternative convention. So to get back to, to this example, Reichenbach is suggesting that just because these two descriptions are equivalent and that they refer to the same world, they represent the same world, it doesn't mean that one shouldn't be preferred on empirical grounds. And he, in a footnote in his book, says that by equivalent descriptions, I'm, I'm referring to this position I, I developed in the case of geometry. Now, people are familiar with the idea that you can use a range of different geometries to represent the same physical process, which is why we think that geometry of the world is something which is, in a sense, underdetermined, and in a sense, it's conventional to hold that the local environment is Euclidean, is, in a sense, 
a convention. It's not forced by the data. We can equivalently represent things using a different geometry. But there is empirical content here. So talking about uh, Poincaré's conventionalism elsewhere, Reichenbach says that Poincaré was right if he wanted to say the choice from, of one from a class of equivalent descriptions is a matter of convention. But he would be mistaken if, if, if he believed that the determination of natural geometry, in a sense, defined is a matter of convention. He says that nat the natural geometry of our world, or at least our local environment, is Euclidean, must be regarded as a fortunate empirical fact. There are empirical reasons for thinking that it's a simpler way of representing things or a better way of representing things. He doesn't go into a great amount of detail as to what he means by something like simpler or more natural, but it's something that I think is intuitive enough to be able to be useful here. So he certainly doesn't want to say that one of these two descriptions is more true than the other because they're representing the same thing. But one can be more, more useful, it can be better than the other. So he says later on in the direction of time that it's an empirical fact uh, that in all branch systems, I won't go into detail about his branch systems and kind of entropy, but he holds that kind of in all kind of subsystems of the universe, entropy increases in the same direction. They're all kind of coordinated. We don't have some systems you know, decreasing relative to other systems which are increasing. He says, for this empirical reason, the convention of defining positive time through growing entropy is inseparable from accepting causality as a general method of explanation. This is where things get quite interesting. He says, well, there might be those who prefer to give some sort of teleological explanation in terms of you know, some hypothesized final state. And if you are, you tend towards teleological explanations, you might be compelled to use the opposite direction of time in regard to time is going from high entropy to low entropy. But he said that the use of such language would be extremely inconvenient because it would contradict the time direction of psychological experience. So I'm not too sure what he means by psychological experience there. But I think this is the basic sense in which, you know, the, the way in which our brains work, the way in which experience works, does depend on uh, certain causal systems and so on, it's kind of causal idea of perception, uh, whereby it appears to us, therefore, that things really go from past to future. Now, Okay, I'm very close to <laughs> Yeah, okay, five minutes will be sufficient. So we can think about the relative merits of the B theory and the C theory here, and try to give some sort of little heuristic for thinking in the ways in which Weichelbach seems to be thinking here. So an example I've used in this, in this paper that I referred to earlier, causation and time reversal, is just a really simple scaled-down example. It's not like a cosmic logical example is just a game of snooker and it's a way to kind of think about when causal explanations and use of causal terms are actually useful and when they're not. So suppose we see you know, this process here, we see someone hitting the, the keyboard to the red ball, the red ball slows down and so on. You know, there will be a sound emitted when the you know, sound waves coming out when the balls collide with each other and so on. And now we have the second motion which is just that effectively that one play backwards, where the red ball seems to be the, the thing which starts out and collides into the white and knocks the, the key play backwards. Now this seems to be a good candidate for you know, describing this second motion. But the talk, you leave out the sound. Yeah, so it'll be talking about this funny reverse process is a way of describing what we just saw. But it's not the only way. So we naturally think that these two motions presented are fundamentally different, just like the initial video I, I showed you where it seemed that there was something very, very wrong about what that person was doing, putting the bits of paper together. The initial process I showed you, whether it seems that the white ball is struck into the red ball, seems like a reasonable causal process. You can, you can do it yourself on a snooker table. The second case seems to represent an improbable you know, series of coincidences where a red ball is sort of 
thrust into motion by converging heat on the cloth, and then you have these kind of inverse sound waves which you know, collide, you know, coincide with the collision of the red into the white, which causes the white to gain this extra momentum, which isn't just for the red. And then that causes the, the sneaker player's arm to retract against the beliefs of the sneaker player, who thinks they're actually controlling the ball. So two is not reasonable because it involves all these various coincidences and a loss of intentional control and so on. It seems a bad way to describe the process. Now, on the one hand, you think, well, there clearly is two different processes here because one is reasonable, one is not reasonable, only the B theory seems to between them, therefore this, the B theory is better than the C theory. The C theory seems to think that they're just the same process and that's not very helpful. But, whoops. but what I argue in, in, in the paper is that the B theory brings this extra structure of allowing us to think of these two things as representing different possible worlds, where the C theory thinks that they represent a single possible process. I think that this extra structure ultimately is redundant and that it doesn't serve, it doesn't give us anything which allows us to give any important cause of explanation that we can use or we want to use, and it doesn't align with our standard causal intuitions. Secondly, it, because of this, it leads to creating unnecessary sceptical problems regarding the direction of causation, which are kind of broadly analogous to sceptical problems about, about the past, if that's something I have to come on to. So my thought is that what's behind Reichenbach's claims, uh, and, and what should really hold in general, is that we appeal to things like control and probability when we determine whether or not something causes something else to happen, and what, when we try to fix a causal description of a process. So here, when, when we view it in this process, it seems all nice and natural because it straightforwardly corresponds to a situation where the snooker player is striking the white into the red, and well, we tend to explain the movement of the horse here in terms of the snooker player's actions and intentions, that's very reasonable. We don't, you know, we don't naturally explain the red ball's movement in this reverse motion to uh, explain in any meaningful sense the motion of the cue ball. Because it doesn't seem reasonable to doubt, regardless of which way around you see this video, whether the snooker player is in control or not. However you see this, it seems the best explanation is that there is a snooker player striking a white ball into a red ball. When you're seeing it backwards in time, you're just seeing it from the wrong perspective. You're not seeing a situation where there's a loss of agential control. It doesn't seem the right way to represent this. Likewise, when we view this backwards in time, there's this series of numerous coincidences. So like I said, there's a convergence of heat on the cloth propelling the ball. Uh, there's these concentrating inverse sound waves, which plays a bit of you know, an expansionary role in why the, the white ball moves faster than the red ball did, and so on. But these will not form a very good causal model of the situation. Probability considerations, rather, play a constitutive role in guiding our causal intuitions and causal inference in the first place. So the idea is that so long as you have access to beliefs about control and the facts about the probability, they will trump the order in which the thing was presented to you with respect to earlier and later. So there will be sufficient for you to dictate uh, which is the causal process. The direction of time itself doesn't really play any important role. So that is, we ought to take the Q movement to be the cause of the Red Bull's movement, regardless of which way we perceive these two things happening. So we can say that the two different motions represent the same reality, but they both represent a reality in which the white wall causes the Red Bull to move. We don't suddenly throw away causal explanations entirely, and that's kind of the key point. So we can do all that. We can get this back without appealing to there being some primitive direction of time playing an important role. So we don't need the extra structure of the B theory here. It seems just the order in which these things happen, you know, this between us order, is going to be enough to allow us to infer a natural causal direction of the process, and that will allow us to communicate causal information effectively and give good causal explanations. I think that's what Reichenbach means when he talks about determining a natural direction of time.
So what the B theory does is allow you to have further kind of sceptical problems as to whether the direction of, of time is actually fully independent of our standard algorithms for making beliefs about the direction of time. So it raises a kind of, you know, a set of problems which you don't get out of the C theory. Firstly, causal relations seem to be something beyond the, you know, the, the control and probability facts. The B theory, in, in, in principle, allows us to be sceptical as to whether the Q action really caused the variable's <coughs> movement. We could really be in a backwards in time world, contrary to our beliefs. And because of this, it, it seems that causal relations are going to lack explanatory force. Uh, explanatory force. And if it really could be the case that all the causal arrows are pointing against what we believe, then they don't seem to be doing the job of explaining why we make the causal beliefs in the first place that we do. If you want to know a bit more about that, you can, uh, you can read, read the paper which discusses this. So, just to kind of go back to compare these two views, Morden has this view that we need to think that earlier states produce later ones, because without this we don't have an, a, a, a way of getting rid of the second kind of atypicality. But Reichenbach is showing that even within the C theory, it's effectively, he says it's a physical law that causality things going from past to future into a causal sense which respects our causal algorithms. It's a physical law that that governs the universe. He says the, the time direction of growing entropy, uh, uh, for the, the time direction of growing entropy, therefore the interaction point is the beginning, not the end of the evolution of a branch system, uh, like, like the universe itself. The statistical relations uh, relationships here account for our conception that the past produces the future and not vice versa. He says here produces is merely a statistical concept. We don't need to appeal to some sort of unanalyzed, deeper metaphysical idea of production, which comes out of the B theory. So I said I didn't really have a conclusion to this talk, but uh, to sum up, this is the best thing I can think right now. Is in order to Think about whether there's something missing from the C theory. You have to get the C theory right. And I think what's important here is that just because the C theory holds that past and future descriptions are equivalent, they describe the same world, it doesn't mean that they naturally present the world in equivalent ways. And that there are many clear senses in which it's more natural to represent the world as going from past to future than from future to past, because that gets the causal facts right. Regardless of which way we describe the world, we are often referring to the same set of causal facts, and that's something which is, uh, I think, very important. And that's where I'll leave it for discussion. <laughs>